Hello, welcome back to another Dragon Plus live stream. I am your host, uh, Bart Carroll. With me is, uh, as we do every other week these days, thankfully, is Jeremy Crawford, lead rules designer of Dungeons and Dragons, lead designer of the Player's Handbook, and the game's managing editor. Hi, everyone. So welcome back, Jeremy. Thank you. Good to be back. This uh, is two weeks in a row. Uh, well, we we needed to catch up. We I have missed you so much. We oh, needed man. to catch up because you were <laughs> crazy busy on Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, everything surrounding those products. We hadn't had you in since mid August, and so here we are in October. Yeah, it's like a whole month just went poof. Yeah, <laughs> but we were making we were making D and D books. Yes, and what. We actually did so much this summer that many people don't realize that in addition to those two books, we also did two children's books. Yes. The ABCs of D&D, the one, two, threes of D&D. We did a coloring book. All right. The Adventures Outlined. We did, uh, we got, there's the dice for uh, Waterdeep. There's the map pack and accessories for, for Mad Mage and Guildmaster's Guide. Yep. Uh, don't forget the card gift sets. Oh, that right. we also got ready. Yes. Uh, All of that was this summer. <laughs> so... So some of us have been a little scarce <laughs> online <laughs> because uh, we have been so far in the D&D workshop getting all of these goodies ready. Uh, but now we can breathe a little bit. Plus, we had uh, a special request uh, on behalf of myself, really, for the last two weeks in a row. We've been working on a special D&D adventure for Extra Life. Uh, it had some mechanics. It had some magic items. Last week, we started on the Powered Armor. I'll, I'll give a little introduction for folks that might have missed it last week. Uh, but we did halfway through a design pass. What would you call the process? So we are, at this point, doing what we sometimes refer to as game development. We also sometimes refer to this as uh, finishing design. Um, and also, it incorporates a bit of editing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's essentially, it's a part of the process that occurs after we have a draft, mm -hmm. and then we start banging on the design to make sure it works, that it's going to hold up to repeated play. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly whenever we design something from many different D&D tables, we need to make sure it's resilient to endure play at many different types of D&D tables. This is different from, say, homebrew material, mm -hmm. where you only have to make sure it works for your group of players. And as the DM, you also know that you can modify it on the fly if you need to. Whereas when we're designing something like this for tens of thousands of D&D players all over the world, we've got to make sure as many of them as possible mm -hmm. are going to have fun with it, they're not going to have so many questions about it that those questions start to undermine their fun. Right. Uh, and really, one of the big things I always go back to is we need to make sure the game mechanics are doing a good job of selling the story mm -hmm. of, in this case, it's a magic item. It could We could be talking about a monster. We could be talking about a class feature. We could be talking about an entire class. Yes. It's always... One of the things I often say to the designers when I'm evaluating design for an upcoming D&D book is uh, make sure the story text uh, isn't writing checks that the rules can't cash. Mm -hmm. You always want to make sure the rules are cashing the checks uh, that the story text uh, wrote. Uh, and so that's one of the things we were doing here. In our last episode, we looked at, like, what is the powered armor supposed to do? Right. And uh, so, yeah, so kind of uh, stepping back quickly, uh, again, what we did uh, for Extra Life this year. Last year, we, we created a couple of adventure materials which are still available on the DMs Guild. Uh, the Lost Kenku, Sean Wood created. Uh, the Turtle Package was the playable race. Mm -hmm. And uh, One Grung Above, Chris Lindsay had created. Uh, this year, we're working on uh, a sort of alternate expedition to the Barrier Peaks. <laughs> only because I'm infatuated with a little bit of chocolate and peanut butter and the sci-fi and fantasy. We didn't want to, I didn't want to recreate Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. That adventure exists and it's great. Uh, and what I wanted to do was still touch into, you know, a bit of that flavor and use a bit of that setting. So for this adventure though, uh, it would be remiss not to include probably the most uh, famous uh, magic item from it, the powered armor. So uh, we created a version of it for that, uh, that that we've been working on editing now. Uh, again, uh, just a couple of notes on Extra Life before we dive into design. And I will say, we're, we're uh, Jeremy and I were chatting. We'll probably end up 
spending maybe half of, half of this uh, live stream talking about the powered armor. Mm -hmm. We also want to answer more of your questions. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get them out in front of Jeremy. So if you do have a question, please do put that in chat. Uh, we are collecting them. Uh, just preface it with question at the beginning. And uh, we'll get to uh, as many of those as we can. Uh, in any case, Extra Life, uh, we've kicked that off. Again, it's in support of the uh, Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Uh, you guys watching are awesome. Our donors and everyone participating and volunteering and, and just uh, being a part of it all are awesome. We're almost at uh, 100,000 in donations already. So wow, uh, that's that, great. It is. It's a. It's a. It's a great number. We had a small <laughs> web. The uh, Extra Life website had a small bug yesterday where it looked like everyone had raised over two million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they really did. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. There was a, a thermostat problem. I believe that is now corrected and numbers are accurate. But we're right, right under 100,000. Uh, so thank you, everyone involved. Uh, going back to the game, and we've got some more Extra Life uh, activities that we'll talk uh, about later on. But again, this adventure is going to be in the DMs Guild. We're aiming to drop it on or around November 3rd on Extra Life Game Day. Uh, it's out with playtesters at the moment. We've been getting some feedback already. Uh, Mick Chambers, thank you, from the Kansas City Area D&D Club. Uh, Michael Porkinghorn from uh, uh, Relic of the Past podcast. And uh, Mario Ortegan uh, from the Elwarius Twitch channel. I believe I saw uh, Mario in chat a little bit earlier. So uh, thank you all and uh, welcome again. And uh, the feedback was great. We're collecting more and more, including feedback from, uh, from Jeremy. So why don't we do that? Why don't we dive into where we were with the powered armor and then we'll field some of your questions. And, uh, and then get to some, some of our news and announcements here. So, <clears throat> excuse me, where we last left off last time, uh, we had gotten through a bit of the description of the power armor. Uh, we <laughs> and we didn't even get all the way through the description before Jeremy astutely caught something that uh, I took for granted from the original description. The armor always stands upright, even when not being worn, which was... I think just a throwaway line, meaning, hey, when you find it, it's standing there. It, it looks like a suit of armor that's waiting for somebody to enter. But rules-wise, it could be interpreted that that meant while you're wearing this armor, you cannot be knocked prone, which was not, not the intent. Right, right. So, and so we talked last time about that sentence uh, either needing to just be cut entirely or... Uh, we need a feature added uh, mm -hmm. that does indeed make you immune to being knocked prone right. while you're wearing the armor. It, it does enough. We cut it. Uh, same with... Oh, so uh, so we moved on. Uh, if we've got the stats for the armor, we can show those. Uh, yeah, then we got to... While wearing this armor, uh, you can tell that my, my notes have been at my desk all week because they're covered in my lunch. <laughs> while wearing the... <laughs> <laughs> now, I, now I want to do some... Investig investigative work and see if I can figure out what you had oh. for lunch based on the stains on this powered armor. I, I will say last week was a lot of donuts brought into the office week for some <laughs> it's reason. It's true. So it's either the donuts or the beignets smeared all over my uh, paperwork. Wait, uh, where are my beignets? I don't know. The bill brought, oh, you, I think you were out. Oh. Because, yes. <sighs> You were out. Uh, well, so here, here's where we left off on a question. While wearing this armor, your strength increases by 1 to a maximum of 20. Now, <clears throat> the discussion was the increased by 1 had its own set of potential complications. It might be better to say your strength uh, increases 2 and then a number such as 18 or 19 or even 20. Exactly. And we left it uh, sort of an open question. <laughs> In the week since, have you uh, given any consideration to having a magic item that would take your strength all the way to 20 or taking it to 18 or 19 in line with existing magic items would be more recommended? I would take it to 18 or 19. Okay. And the, the reason is this... This item story mm -hmm. in in the D and D multiverse is not that this is the ultimate way to become as strong as you can possibly become. Right. Uh, if if this was the 
the s strengthiest strength armor of strength, then yes, let's go all the way up. No, this is not the load lifter from right. Aliens. Yes. This, yep. this is an exosuit uh -huh. of armor that astronauts would, would wear, and it gives them a set amount of, of strength. Yeah, so, yeah. So I, I like setting it probably at 18. 18? Yeah. 18 it is. Well, which also is aligned with the original suit of armor, which gave you a strength of 18. Well, look at that. Zero, zero. We're being classic <laughs> right here on Twitch. Uh, and then we had, uh, and you have dark vision to a range of 60 feet, and we decided that would be, if you already have it, uh, then your dark vision extends 60 feet. Yes. Although, since since we last look at the, looked at this, yes. I have a new idea about what to do with dark fish. Okay. But I'm not going to spill the beans yet. All we'll right. get to it. There was a fury of conversation because the debate was, you're wearing a visor, uh -huh. and it's giving you dark vision 60, so it'd be like glasses. But if you are wearing somebody else's prescription glasses, doesn't that screw up your, yep. your dark vision? And so that's, I have, as I said, <laughs> I have a new idea. <laughs> All right, so do, do we want to tackle that or move on to Let's move on. Okay. Because I'll bring it up when we get to a later part of the magic atom. Uh, so now here we get to uh, a bit of the story text. And in, in the adventure story, uh, there is a, the mad scientist. And he has discovered the, the crashed, crashed ship. Uh, he's used its technology. He's researching the technology. Some of it has power cells which gives the magic items a number of charges before they run dry. Well, he's not satisfied with that. What if we can use the wearer's life energy to mm -hmm. kind of continue to circumvent that, and you have this perpetual magic item. So, uh, so I, have, I have feedback on this sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and as I said last time, rules development really is this detail-oriented, where we go sentence by sentence, word by word, to make sure everything is singing. So there, the issue in this sentence is, when I first read this, mm -hmm. and there was this reference to energy cells, mm -hmm. I had no idea what it was referring to. Mm -hmm. So I had to then go and read the adventure, because mm -hmm. also often a part of rules development is actually doing story research mm -hmm. to figure out what, again, is the story goal mm -hmm. of this piece of game mechanics that I am fine-tuning. So then I discovered, ah, okay, there are these energy cells in the adventure. Right. So a magic item, and again, I'd be saying the same thing about a spell, uh, about a monster, needs to stand on its own as a game object. Mm -hmm. It needs to be clear in how it functions. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I need this to tell me a little bit more about energy cells. Mm -hmm. For instance, I need to know how many energy cells can this powered armor contain? It's simplest if we say one. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a slot that you put in. Yes. Um, because otherwise, since right now the powered armor doesn't have a limit, mm -hmm. I could run around the adventure, get yeah. every energy cell and put it Chain in. Chain them together. And basically be charged up for life. Like my dad would do with the extension outlets. Oh, God, himself. don't do it. I, did your house burn down? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm laughing, and then you're going to tell me, yes, our house burned down. And I'm going, mm. No, but this was a case where at one point I was stringing up the Christmas lights uh -huh. and I was, uh, what's the, 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 the most idiotic way was like, hey, how come I can't have, uh, was it two, uh, an extension cord that had the two plugs at both ends? Well, because you plug it in and the other end is alive. And <laughs> So don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> so let's let's add in a, a limit that it can have one energy cell in it at, at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and even better, I would suggest that the item by default come with an energy cell in it mm -hmm. with a random number of charges still in that energy cell. That way the item is basically loaded and ready to go. And then immediately the user of the item gets to see how this sort of charges versus hit points mm -hmm. mechanic works. Because mm -hmm. right now, the whole neat energy cell thing is sort of sitting outside the item, and we want to bring it into uh, the item mm -hmm. uh, so that it's clear how it works. Okay. 
So uh, it, it has energy cells with, say, one to 20 charges. One mm -hmm. would be already pre-installed. Mm -hmm. Or now, now we come to sort of the, uh, a big section here, which is, OK, the armor has a set number of different capabilities and right. powers. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of this was based on the original powered armor, where it can do this, that. It can it's slice and dice. Uh, so this, this powered armor looks to, hey, you can use a charge to gain certain abilities or protections, mm -hmm. or you can use a certain amount of your hit points to gain the same capabilities or protections. Right. So broadly, do you want to broadly tackle that mechanic before we dive into the line by line or just go line by line? So let's let's talk about uh, the whole the whole thing. Overall, I, I like it because it, it is... Uh, giving me this this feeling of being in this powered armor that is sort of a Swiss army knife mm -hmm. with all these different capabilities. So that feels right mm -hmm. uh, and fun. Yeah, I'm gonna get in this armor and it's gonna give me these different things I can do. Uh, and I like that the capabilities, some of them are combat related, but some of them will also be useful outside combat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a big fan anytime we're designing something for the game of when possible, giving something a non-combat use. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes it's clear the thing is there for battle, and that's it. It's a sword. Right. Uh, but if it makes story sense, I love giving you some toy you can use when you're exploring, mm -hmm. when you're in social interaction, uh, so that in a way you get to enjoy your toys uh, as often as possible. Mm -hmm. And again, we're, I often like to say we're in the enjoyment business. Uh, <laughs> and so as much as possible, I like people to be able to enjoy the thing they got. And particularly because magic items also are relatively rare mm -hmm. in 5th edition. Right. Uh, and so I like to make them count mm -hmm. when you get them. All right. In this sentence, uh, I'm going to dive deep again. Yes. It says, at the start of your turn, you can use a bonus action to draw power from an energy cell or sacrifice hit points to gain one of the following benefits until the start of your next turn. Right. All right. We don't need the words at the start of your turn. Okay. Um, bonus action, by definition, is something you use on your turn. And given the different abilities on, on the subsequent list, it's fine if you activate those mm. abilities at any point on your turn. Okay. Uh, so you get to decide on your turn when you want uh, to activate these. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't, we don't need to be that precise about the timing of that bonus action. Sometimes in other places in the game we do, but mm. this is not one of those times. So, yeah? I was going to interject because I'm reading this now and wondering what you would feel if it said uh, blah, 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 to gain one or more of the following benefits. Uh, I would say... Or would you keep it to, you're picking one of these. Let's do one. Okay. Um, so that you don't turn this into an analysis paralysis mm. fiesta. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, for those of you watching, I am often concerned when I am developing game mechanics that we do not present so many options to the player that when it's their turn, everything grinds to a halt. Uh, as they study, okay, how many charges can I spend? How many of these can I have active at once? Yes. This not only comes from uh, years and years and years of work on D&D &D and DMing D&D &D and playing D&D, &D, <laughs> but it also comes from playing a ton of other tabletop games. Mm. And I'm constantly studying other games. And one of the things I notice when I'm playing uh, games by other designers that will annoy me most is something in the game that triggers analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes it's unavoidable. Some players are just indecisive or they really, they groove on pondering things yes. and that's fine. Right. That's fine. But I don't like it when the game almost is like coaxing you to be frozen by too many choices and then the whole game becomes like picking things from menus. Right. No, and as the job of the DM is to kind of read the room and right. see where the social cues are. And mm -hmm. one person might enjoy that analysis. The rest of the table might be getting bored. Mm -hmm. So mitigate the circumstances where that would, would come up. 
Uh, I think you also raise a good point, which is, hey, for folks watching that are interested in, in design and development work in a professional level, it seemed like the uh, recommendation there was play lots of D&D, play lots of games. Yes. And yes. Uh, uh, study and analyze mm -hmm. different rule sets. See what you like in, in all of them and what you might not like. Yeah, I, I do often get asked by people, like, Jeremy, what do you recommend I do to prepare for a career as a D&D designer mm -hmm. or a designer of some other type of tabletop game? And pardon me, one of the things I often recommend is, first off, master the game you want to design for. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the piece people usually, you know, they figured that part out. Right. Um, but the other thing I would say, especially if you're going to work on a tabletop game like D&D, &D, is not only play a ton of other games, study them. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean study them deeply. Like, pick up a rule book for a bunch, for various board games and study how those rules are worded. Mm -hmm. Try to discern why did the writer of those rules pick one word versus another to express a particular concept. You'll find yourself growing as a designer the more you study what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I even do that studying when I play video games, actually. I'm not only looking at the mechanics that are in play, but I look at how are those mechanics communicated mm -hmm. to the player, uh, whether it's through interface elements or gameplay feedback. So much of game design is actually communication. Uh, a lot of people think game design is about, oh, it's all about wacky ideas, and that's it is important. But the wacky idea is no good if the communication fails. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. and communication in a, in a game like D&D is, is words in a book. In a video game, communication is the user interface, mm -hmm. usually. Uh, in board games, that communication is usually in the physical components. Mm -hmm. All of those things, whether books, physical components, or user interface, their job is to communicate the game mechanics. And in my mind, they are actually often the most important thing in the game because if they fail, the game fails. Uh, it doesn't matter how brilliant your or clever your game design ideas are if your communication fails because then the person is like, I don't know how to mm. use this. I don't want to use this. <laughs> uh, there, was this amazing, there was this amazing study done in Japan a number of years ago where uh, these Japanese designers studied people's use of ATM machines and studied their use of ATM machines using this sort of very beautiful user-friendly user interface versus these other ATM machines with a really kind of bare bones, unfriendly UI. Keep in mind, both sets of ATM machines had all the same features. Mm -hmm. But what they found observing people's behavior is the people believed that the ATM machines that had the more accessible and friendlier interface could do more mm. than the other ones. And so often you'll see engineers and others say, well, you know, who cares about all this, you know, the Chrome and the UI? What matters is the features and what they can do. Right. But what's been found in user interface study after user interface study is that communication and beauty are key to making a person even want to use mm. your tool. Uh, and that is a crucial part of game design. And it's why we focus so much on how things are worded, how they're presented, because we want to essentially invite you in, get you into the game design house, and make you feel comfortable and make you want to use the thing. Are you saying Control-Alt-Delete is not a friendly... <laughs> <laughs> I, still, I still ponder that one. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and again, making it usable, this is why I was leaning on you, because I'm cheating and I work with you. So I wanted to, uh, <laughs> so, so getting back to some of the options for using the charges or your hit points, uh, are, are we good diving into, say, the first one of those? Let's do it. Let's go through each one. All right. First one, gain a bonus to AC of plus one to plus three. The idea being it gives you some protection, mm -hmm. not too crazy much. Mm -hmm for one charge, five hit points per point of bonus. So you can also decide, how much do I want to invest in this right. protection right now? So this one, right out of the gate, I want to cut it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here's why. Yeah. So each of these benefits, unless they tell you otherwise, lasts only until the start of your next turn. Right. So the problem with this benefit mm. is you could spend a charge or even burn five of your hit points to boost your AC mm -hmm. And then the DM could just decide, eh, I'm not going to attack you. Mm. Now, 
psychologically, if you giving this yourself your bonus caused the DM to decide not to attack you, <laughs> I, it was in, it is arguably a successful feature. Yes. But I don't like it when our design encourages those sorts of head games. Yeah. And I also don't like it when design creates a feel bad experience. I don't want a person to sit there and burn a charge or burn hit points and really feel like nothing came from it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, will, I like there to be more immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice almost everything in fifth edition, we've designed it so that uh, almost any feature you use, it's essentially you push a button and something happens. Mm -hmm. There are very few things in the game where you sort of, you, you load a gun and then wait for it to go off. <laughs> Unless you've decided to do that to yourself by like readying in action or, you know, that kind of thing. So Chekhov's magic item is not... Uh... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, so what I would recommend here is cutting this mm -hmm. and actually just making the powered armor always have a plus one bonus to AC. That's what I was going to... I was also, as you were saying, well, this is something you'd have to do every round. Okay, I'm going to have mm -hmm. to give it plus one, plus right. one, plus one. I forgot. I didn't tell the DM how many bonus I put into it. Yep. Uh, so yeah. let's cut it and give it a static plus one. Plus one, AC. because it is a little odd right now that you have this legendary armor that, sure, it is plate armor, so you mm -hmm. are getting the benefit of plate armor, uh, but... Uh, it's not actually making you uh, any harder to hit right. than regular armor. Uh, now, I did ponder replacing this with creating some kind of force field that mm -hmm. would protect you, which we could model by giving you temporary hit points. Mm -hmm. So that is something we could consider. Now, and that is part of the original powered armor, mm -hmm. which was it had its own set of hit points. Right. Mm -hmm. Now. The one reason why I'm still pondering that as a possibility is then we start stepping on the toes of the resistance uh, because one of the options is gain resistance to one type of damage of your choice, okay. uh, which could also result in a little bit of feel bad mm -hmm. because you might give yourself this resistance and then it not actually come into play. Right. Unless, unless the resistance you choose is, say, fire resistance right before you run into the burning building. Or the resistance lasts longer than a round. It could, but one, one way we could solve sort of both mm -hmm. issues is strike the AC bonus and strike the resistance and have this give you a nice big chunk of uh, temporary hit points. Okay. Uh, the beauty of temporary hit points is they don't stack, mm -hmm. uh, so a person, it's impossible for a person to like hit this option round after round and just their temporary hit point pool just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like they're gonna give themselves a little bit of temporary hit points uh, and there's no reason for them to give themselves more until uh, those temporary hit points have run out or gotten very low mm -hmm. and they decide to replace them. Okay. Now what we'll want to do when we decide how many temporary hit points is we're going to uh, want to make sure you get at least twice as many temporary hit points as the hit points you spent mm -hmm. uh, to get it. Because it would make no sense if, like we said, hey, spend five hit points potentially, and then you get 2d4 temporary hit points, which would average out to five. <laughs> so not a good trade-off. So we want to make sure uh, we're at least doubling your investment. Mm -hmm. Although I also like the idea of there being a random element, mm -hmm. you know, sort of this fluctuating power field. So we would, mm -hmm. we'd want to roll dice and uh, either it's enough dice where, you know, we get the average up mm -hmm. high enough. So it's averaging out to be at least 10 temporary hit points. Or we say you get five temporary hit points plus some random amount. Okay. Um, but so everyone listening, uh, I'm throwing out numbers here. Nailing down numbers like that is one of the last things we do when we finalize design. Because what I would want us to do is go through all the other elements of this powered armor, then go back through and get the numbers exactly right for the item's rarity and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So in a way right now we're saying, okay, directionally, we want this sort of effect. Uh, this, this flickering energy shield, mm -hmm. uh, 
I know we're going to want it to be at least 10 temporary hit points. Okay. So again, you're doubling your investment, mm -hmm. but we might be able to go higher. And we'll math that out uh, once we've gone through everything. So this is my 401k armor. <laughs> yes. So let's let's table that. Yep. We're going to scrap the AC and the resistance. We'll consider mm -hmm. a energy field for temporary hit points. Yep. Uh, how about the flying speed? I like it. Okay. Uh, especially given the uh, until start of your next turn. Uh, this is not, of course, a super high speed, but I like it mm -hmm. because I'm imagining, you know, you're having this little, these little boosts uh, from the jets. Right. Um, and someone looking at this might think, man, 10 feet is really low, mm -hmm. uh, but you can still get to places you wouldn't be able to get to normally. And story-wise, this is your, your extra vehicular armor. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just using it like a 2001 pod where you're just mm -hmm. piloting around mm -hmm. at, at a, a, a slight uh, speed. Um, I, would, I would be a little generous and up it to at least 15 feet okay. so that if you dash, you're going to move as far as you would doing a, just a regular move. Okay. How about the fire the armor's arm-mounted laser? Because we have to have a laser. Yes. Yeah, I like this. It is not doing enough damage for the investment. Okay. So right now, um, you you could potentially be spending five hit points. Oh, sorry, five hit points for the damage. But if you if you do the one d four option, that averages out to doing only two and a half mm -hmm. damage. So it's not a good investment, even as a bonus action. Because mm -hmm. keep in mind, everybody, this laser you're getting to fire as a bonus action. So this is on top of uh, mm. uh, all of your other regular attacks. Right. So this doesn't need to be crazy, mm -hmm. but it could be a little better. Okay. Um, I mean, I would, I would want it to, at the very least, do the damage uh, of a crossbow. Mm -hmm. um, but I have my DMG open because, hey, in the Dungeon Master's Guide, we put in lasers. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and also energy cells, by the way. So the, our energy cell uh, writing and the adventure could match up. Which we would want. Mm -hmm. So uh, in all cases, we would make sure that we've got the correct reference, that mm -hmm. if folks have a question, here's the page in the DMG. Yeah. If you want to create your own or modify accordingly, here's the page in the DMG that that's, is suitable to the adventure. So uh, this laser pistol in the DMG does 3D6 radiant damage uh, every time you fire it. Uh, it has a normal range of 40 feet and a long range of 120. Now, this power armor goes all the way out to 120 feet. Mm -hmm. Now, in a magic item, I like often avoiding uh, the normal range, long range mm -hmm. distinction of mundane weapons. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is split the, the difference and uh, bring this down to 60 feet. Um, and as far as the damage goes, I would want it to be at least uh, 2d6, um, so that you are you're on average doing seven damage. But if we did 3d6, you're on average doing double your hit point investment. Now we are going to have to math that out in the end to make sure we're not making this way too powerful because mm -hmm. that's just a freebie attack. Um, but it actually sounds about right, uh, and you are burning charges for it, and this is a legendary item, but again, we'll, 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 we'll have to math it out in the end. Uh, and I wouldn't have it scale up. Right now, you're able to like... Right now, yeah, pump it up. But mm -hmm. again, that, that kind of goes back to the how much am I putting into the AC? Well, that's another thing to track, so it doesn't right. scale up. I do like, as, as people point out, uh, if you've already designed it, it's already designed. Mm -hmm. So matching the DMG as closely mm -hmm. as possible makes sense. And I think from a story perspective, this isn't the suit of battle armor. Right. You know, this isn't they're going off to war with the greatest mm -hmm. laser weapon. This is just a, a weapon you know, for, for self-defense. This is a pistol yeah. that, that uh, is meant to be conveyed. Yeah. Now, the one danger of us putting in a bonus action laser pistol mm -hmm. that you're firing off is if 
and this is where we have to also think about different classes wearing this armor. Mm -hmm. uh, if a class that already has a lot of pressure on their bonus action mm -hmm. pops into this armor, then this extra damage sort of comes out in the wash mm -hmm. uh, because we have a number of classes. Uh, the monk, for instance, uh, is an example of this, uh, or the rogue where their bonus actions are getting gobbled up quite a bit already by mm -hmm. their own features, or in the rogue's case, rogues are often doing two weapon fighting. Something like this then just becomes sort of um, sprinkles on top and a cool extra option. Yes. But imagine putting in a spellcaster mm -hmm. who happens to be proficient uh, with plate armor in here, and especially a spellcaster who has not a whole lot of pressure on their bonus action. Yeah. Suddenly, just as long as they've got charges or hit points to burn. Here's a free shot. Free shot yeah. every single round. Yeah. Uh, so that would be, so when we look at the math of this, it's that scenario where which might motivate me to lower the damage a bit. Mm -hmm. So it really does feel like sprinkles on top uh, and not, uh, man, I just... I'm just firing lasers round after round. Um, because also, here's the other thing. Some characters don't need their hit points as much as other characters. Right. Depending on the DM. And depending on uh, the party, how much healing are you yeah. going to be able to access? Yeah. Some DMs are really good about spreading damage around in a party. Mm -hmm. Other DMs uh, kind of, I th I've noticed some DMs without even realizing they're doing it, will sometimes... DM as if they're DMing an MMO, and they will dump all the damage on the quote unquote tank, mm -hmm. even though in fifth edition there really is there really is no such thing. I yeah. mean, yes, there are characters who can force somebody to attack right. them, who can protect their friends and whatnot. Uh, but there's nothing in the game that mandates that the person wearing the heaviest armor with the most hit points is the person you're going to hit a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as a DM, have my monsters just respond to what they're seeing. Because mm -hmm. the monsters and NPCs I run, they don't know what classes these people are. <laughs> but if they see that person over there keep healing people, well, they're going to open fire on that cleric. Yeah. Or if this other person is hurling blasts of fire that do massive amounts of damage to a group, they're going to try to burn that spellcaster down. Sure. Uh, so in my games, the spellcasters need their hit points. Uh, but I have noticed that in many games, spellcasters can kind of skate by and it's like, eh, hit points, you know, who cares about them? <laughs> so we'll, we'll figure out the number and mm -hmm. again, we'll make sure that no troll can wear the powered armor because that would just be a disaster <laughs> uh, untold. Uh, should we look at uh, translate writing in any non-magical language? Yeah, so this is an example of the uh, non-combat related bit that I really like uh, because, you know, it's very, you know, you can imagine, you know, you're, you're not only in the, the spaceship perhaps where you found this, but someplace else and your, your armor taps in and, and translates the thing right. for you. And again, relates back to the original suit of power mm -hmm. armor, so uh, definitely trying to keep in line with the uh, original vision there. But there is something for us to modify, because right now it does not specify how much writing. Mm. So it just says translate writing. Uh, could I... Uh, and also doesn't specify where this writing is. Um, so if I wanted to be a real jackass <laughs> as a player, I could read this and say, all right, one bonus action, I burn five hit points, and I translate writing. Oh. Uh, everywhere. <laughs> I, I am Google Translate. <laughs> Boom. Right. I now have, Boom. I can yep. read everything, and I've written it down. I mean, of course that's not the intent. Right. But we should be a little clearer. So... First off, we should say where the writing is. Mm -hmm. At the very least, it should be writing uh, within your line of sight. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it could also be within a certain range. Uh, or it could be like what we do uh, in a spell like Comprehend Languages where you have to actually touch it. Mm -hmm. uh, that helps um, rein in potential cheese. Uh, <laughs> also... Uh, good to specify a rough amount. Um, so it could be a number of words, mm -hmm. it could be a number of pages. Um, I, Unless it's a traditional spell that's been around in edition after edition that specifies a certain number of words, mm -hmm. I prefer not to get that finicky. Sure. Uh, so 
you know, it's like a page of writing, and of course someone could counter, but Jeremy, a page can have many different numbers of words on it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if the writer really crammed all the writing on, oh, that's fine. It's, I think line of sight is meant to be within the spirit of the item. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, sort of generally as much writing as you could read in the round that you're given, I think is also part sure. of it. So maybe we don't need to state that, but yeah. Yeah. we'll... We'll, we'll, we'll you could uh, say a thousand words. <laughs> a thousand words. I'm just... A thousand and one words. I picked that because he... Because a typical, here's a little bit of D&D trivia, a, a typical D&D book has about 965 words on it. Ah. All right, so you could read yep. a, a, uh, a standard. Uh, uh, per page. Per page. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I do want to make sure that we've got a little bit of time for questions here. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving ahead quickly to... Fill the armor with up to eight hours of air, allowing you to breathe normally in any environment, granting you immunity to harmful gases and vapors. So I would simplify this and just allow you to breathe in any environment. Okay. The, the gases thing always ends up being a headache, particularly because we have not approached the gases in a systematic way in the game. And so then it starts begging all sorts of questions of, well, what... You know what? What? What is you know a gas in the game? Uh, and uh, so, so I would want us to just say it lets you breathe. Use this bonus action, and this option uh, we should point out is exceptional. Unlike the others that last only until the start of your next turn, this lasts this, for the next yes. eight hours. And again, it harkens back to uh, to the original mm -hmm. item. So, uh, and then uh, we've still got about fifteen minutes here. I do want to get some questions, but uh, the last section of the armor is uh, again within the spirit of the armor. It sort of had this emergency fail safe. You are going to get dropped to zero hit points. The Armor Institute's uh, an emergency protocol locks you in. Uh, you know, story-wise, being you're you're in stasis until mm -hmm. you can get to to healing. Uh, armor locks you into place. It can't be opened without dealing damage to you. Uh, so this was also sort of a challenge. Mm -hmm. This was the risk reward for wearing the armor. Uh, you you uh, can't be targeted by spell or magic effect that does not restore hit points. Uh, and uh, medical systems grant you advantage on your death saving throw. So uh, essentially this was the idea of you're locked in place, uh, you're going to be making your, your death saving throws, and if you can come out of it on your own, great, otherwise you're, you're going to be locked in there. So I would hugely simplify this yes. and boil it down to just the final bullet, you have advantage on death saving throws. Okay. Here's why. Uh, the first bullet uh, really introduces a lot of questions about, uh, I mean, so it says it locks into place such that it can't be opened without dealing 11 slashing damage. So then I immediately want to know, well, so this implies I can open it, mm. even though it said it locked into place. All right. So then how do I open it? You're, you're, yes. And if you're already at zero hit points and this automatically deals damage to you, what that means in our rules is you just instantly get a death saving throw failure. And so then it basically the armor is calibrated to kill you uh, if, a, <laughs> if, a person, if a person can figure out how to open it. Right. Um, at, then the next thing is actually a really cool idea of this defensive force field, but then it introduces a different kind of question. And that is, if this armor is capable of protecting me from all harmful magical effects, right. Why is it only doing it when I'm knocked down to zero hit points mm. uh, instead of instead of giving me that protection all the time? The, the original item, and I won't go into it too deeply, but we were playing around with it, and and there was a little bit of a, a gamble here, where the original item you were locked in there, no one could heal you. Ah, interesting. And so you had to make your three death saves mm -hmm. on your own, or or mm -hmm. uh, you didn't die, mm -hmm. but you were kept in stasis mm -hmm. until somebody could get you out of the armor. Got it. Now that, it, I, I, even just talking through that, it feels more story and flavor mm -hmm. and something you would come across as opposed to something you would have as an item. Right. So I'm all in favor of simplification, simplification. Uh, the armor grants you advantages on your death saving throws. Is that too powerful? Would you say grant you advantage on your first or just leave it as? I, I like it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, the armor, the armor wants you, 
uh, to get back up on your feet and clump around. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I mentioned earlier that uh, I thought we should remove dark vision from up above. Yes. Because I'd like us to add dark vision to this list of options. Okay. Uh, where you can give yourself, uh, you can basically turn on this night vision. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, where you're, act you're actually going to burn a charge to activate this, uh, I would uh, give it a really fabulous range. Mm -hmm. uh, like, go go crazy, you know, go out like 300 feet or something, which Ooh. almost no creature has dark vision that goes out that far. But I was going to say two, I'll take three. Uh, but it's... Uh, um, it, it gives you this sudden, like, you can imagine this, like, almost this beam shooting out and you're, like, looking mm -hmm. uh, carefully. Now, the other option is... Rather than giving it a crazy range, yeah. is we make this exceptional like the air, and we just have it be sort of a typical dark vision range of 60 feet or 120 feet, and we have it last for an hour. Um, I, I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think chat was asking about that as well. Mm -hmm. It feels more utilitarian in a way, and something that you would uh, consider burning a charge for, yeah. as opposed to, I need this now. And, and actually, speaking of making the duration an hour, mm -hmm. uh, I would actually do the same with the allowing you to breathe in any environment. I like that as well. It keeps it consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, eight hours, I think, matches the original, but uh, one hour feels sufficient to what we're trying to accomplish here. And also, one hour uh, is very easy to track mm -hmm. uh, for people in the game. Um, as soon as you get to eight hours, uh, it it starts almost sort of getting into meta time uh, because <laughs> often adventures happen in like in sometimes in a, a span of time that is shorter than an hour because once you actually add up the time that you spent in the dungeon you realize wow we just played for four hours uh, uh, it, but the adventure in world actually only took place in 20 minutes uh, All right, and I was slowing down there talking because I was starting to read the yes. stream. So let's Sorry. let's ask. Uh, I was uh, let's ask. Uh, let's answer some questions real quick. I, there was a few from today. Uh, this one was from uh, from a, a little bit. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, where are we? Uh, da, da, da. And uh, by the way, next time we'll math this sucker out because yes. we we talked about mathing it, getting the numbers right. Mm. Uh, we will. So Bart, you have homework. Yes. Uh, please oh, write up go. a new version of this for our next episode. Let's do it. And we're going to math it. I like it. Uh, do you have any other book recommendations you were talking about? Uh, oh, my goodness. I always have book recommendations. User, specifically for game design or user interface or things of that nature. Ah, okay. Got it. So I often, you'll notice, I often love to talk about books. Uh, oh, and people also want to know about the Artificer. Um, yes. So when it comes to books, I often am reading uh, books on history and mythology uh, because, because I work on a fantasy game. Fantasy is so often about resonance of telling stories that feel familiar in some way to you no matter what culture you come from on Earth. There's something wonderfully transcultural about fantasy. And so a part of my work, I always like to drench myself in the myths of the ancient world, uh, in some of the best, uh, some of the best uh, modern fantasy. Uh, I like to read comic books. Uh, also just to see different modes of storytelling because as a dungeon master, I'm also always, uh, uh, so that I'm always sort of, honing my craft as a storyteller. And one of the ways to do that is watch other storytellers mm -hmm. who are outstanding uh, doing their work. Um, when it comes to uh, interface uh, design, that's something I brought up earlier. One thing many of you might not know about me is actually before coming to Wizards of the Coast, I was actually a web developer. Hmm. Um, I've, I've, I did not know yes, that. I, <laughs> I know you've had a various and sundry career. And yes. That was not one of the... Uh, yeah. Items I knew. Yeah, yeah, and, and during those years, I was moonlighting as an RPG writer. Mm -hmm. It was during that time that I co-designed Blue Rose, worked on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Second Edition, uh, did some D20 design work. Um, 
but yeah, my day job in that time was I was a I was a web developer, uh, and uh, the the books that we would read back then on usability apply actually to game design mm -hmm. because so much of the notions of usability and of how people use things is transferable across different modes of design, whether you're designing websites, whether you're designing uh, games, and whether those games are for, again, uh, you know, consoles, computers, uh, books, uh, board games, uh, so many of the principles are the same, which is about clarity, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, about also studying how people actually use things. Because one of the things you discover uh, if, say, you do web usability, uh, and I used to read books by Jacob Nielsen. If you, if you go on Amazon and look for any of his books, he has a number of books on web usability. One of the things that comes up in his books often is that we as humans are terrible often at reporting our own behavior. Mm. Uh, and so often we will say we like something uh, we don't like something, but then if you observe us using the thing, it will we will demonstrate that we actually do apparently like it, or the thing we said we didn't understand, we apparently do know how to use it. It's the devil we know. Yeah, I don't like it, but I'm going to use it by God. Which is one reason why, by the way, when we get uh, playtest feedback by surveys for D and D, mm -hmm. we always have to pair the survey data with actual play experience mm -hmm. of our own and also play experience that we observe at conventions, on streams, because we have to, we have to sort of look like, okay, here's what people are self-reporting mm -hmm. mm. versus what are they actually doing. Interesting. Um, it's one of the reasons why I love, oftentimes people will say, everyone plays class X, no one wants to play class Y. I love then going to the data we get from, say, D&D Beyond yeah. and seeing that the data there does not match up with that at all. Uh, you know, often people will say, you know, the, the least popular class is X, and then you look in D&D Beyond, it's like that's actually one of the most popular classes <laughs> in terms of the characters people are, are making. Yes. That doesn't mean the people are making those members of those classes and have no issues with them. Mm -hmm. But what that does tell us is that in real lived experience, things don't always match up with what people say on the internet. Mm. Uh, and that isn't just true in game design. That Again, that is a core principle when you're studying how people use things. Mm. And so just grab any book on like web usability and you will find principles that you can apply in game design, especially uh, when you are dealing with playtest feedback. Uh, and for instance, once we make this powered armor, I'm going to be interested to see what the feedback is from people who actually use it. Uh, because, <laughs> because we might think, oh, this stuff is all cool, and then sit down at the table and actually use it and go, uh, that wasn't so cool. Right, right. That seemed really cool to Bart and Jeremy when they were talking on, on, yeah. on, on, on Dragon Plus. But, but when I wore it, like, ah, you know, plate armor is yeah. Plate. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, question came in. Uh, we were kind of talking about crazy ideas for a product that's been released. Was there a crazy idea you may have suggested? Somebody on the team suggested you weren't sure was going to be approved, but it ended up in the product anyways. Oh, good question. Um, so, just about every book we do, we do something where we just sort of like this would be fun. Mm -hmm. um, now, the reason why I pause when I was asked that question is I am, like when it comes to our books, I am the final person at the gate. Yes. So there isn't anyone I go to to ask for approval. So that's why I was pausing, because it's like, well, I've never had to ask someone right. if it was okay. Um, earlier on in the design process, I bang ideas around, depending on the book, with uh, my you know, co-designers like Chris Perkins, mm -hmm. Mike Merles, James Wyatt, other, many of the other fine people I've worked with on our many books. Uh, but yeah, I am in an unusual position uh, <laughs> because, frankly, if I wanted to, I could just put anything in. Uh, that, is a, that is a power I do not abuse <laughs> uh, because I am such a firm believer in my job is to be a steward of D&D and also a guardian of what uh, you all, my fellow fans, wants. Mm -hmm. This is not 
this is not a game that is just here for me to do whatever I want. Jeremy Crawford yes, presents. Yes. Uh, if you would know that I had kind of lost it uh, if suddenly every book was just wall-to-wall -wall hags and unicorns. <laughs> you would, you'd go, oh boy. Jer <laughs> Jeremy had lost his self-control because every other page is, yep, here's another hag. Whoops, here's another <laughs> unicorn. There are other things I like too. Vampires, for instance. But, hags I get. The yes. unicorns I never understood the, uh, the interest in. But hey, that's just me. Uh, we're getting close. Because to they're beautiful, Bart. Sure, I know. But, uh, and they sparkle. Uh, yeah. And they heal people. I'm more of a Pegasus person than a unicorn person. And, I and think rainbows, that's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down with rainbow. I love rainbows. <laughs> I get very excited when it's rainy and I know there's a chance. A chance. Yes. I'll drag my kid. And just, and just imagine it. somewhere under that rainbow, there's a unicorn. I... I <laughs> whenever I show my son the, the rainbow in the sky, uh -huh. he already he's can we go to the can we find the end of it and find it like oh it's too far away. Find the pot of gold. Yeah. I don't wanna like no son, it's actually just light refracted through the air. <laughs> oh, so someone asked about the artificer. Can I say can yes, I say of something? Okay, so uh, we were one of the questions I saw in the stream about the artificer is uh, sort of where does the artificer stand? Yes, hags with I, lasers. So hags laughing, can ask. have anything they want as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so uh, we got a lot of playtest feedback when we released the artificer a while ago. Uh, we have tinkered with it. Uh, we've also been focusing on other things, frankly, because mm. our focus always has to be what's going to be in one of our upcoming books. Uh, but especially now that uh, Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron is on the DMs Guild. Yes. The Artificer now is definitely on people's minds. Yes. Uh, and so the question about the Artificer is very timely because this morning uh, I just received the latest feedback from Keith Baker mm. on our latest draft of the Artificer. So uh, Keith, he's fabulous to work with, gave us a lot of feedback to ponder, uh, but it does mean we're inching toward being able to put out in Unearthed Arcana uh, a new version of the class. But it's still a little bit of a ways okay. away because, uh, because Keith, as uh, the guardian of Eberron, had a lot of meaty feedback to give us. And we're trying, basically the needle we're trying to thread with the Artificer is we want it to feel natural for Eberron, but also feel like something that uh, would be a natural fit in another setting as well. Sure, modular, modularity. Exactly, very useful. And, and flexibility. Okay. Um, because sure, Eberron fans will want to be able to have their classic Eberron artificer, but then there are gonna be people in other worlds, playing in other worlds, that also want to play a character whose magic is primarily tied to devices of some kind. Right. Uh, I mean, you can imagine, uh, you know, Going FR has a number of places where artificers would feel at home. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just Lantan, but you can imagine in Halrua and elsewhere. Uh, you know, if you go to Dragonlance, uh, you could imagine there being some artificers among uh, the Tinker Gnomes of course, there. Yeah. Uh, and on and on. You know, I, I would certainly expect to see uh, artificers wandering around. Uh, the City of Doors, uh, the Lady of Pain wondering what the heck are they doing <laughs> with those devices in her city. Uh, Somebody's going to have to fix his powered armor. If it's not yes, an artificer, yes, I don't know. Yeah. And it might not be an Eberron. So yeah, so, but, but that, that is all to say that work is actually proceeding as, I mean, today even work is being done on the artificer. Uh, but as always, we have many many D&D pans and many D&D <laughs> fires, and so we're always juggling which one uh, uh, we're focusing on on any given day. Okay, so, th so there you go, Artificer, it is coming. It's a little ways down the road. Yeah. Uh, we're at three o'clock shortly after, so I am going to kick it over to Greg Tito and the D&D News. Uh, he'll be coming up momentarily, followed by Dice Camera Action at four, when we've got our three uh, guest stars from uh, from Strix's uh, Chicken Foot Coven contest will be joining the game. As always, thanks everyone for spending the last hour with uh, with myself and with uh, Mr. Crawford. It was a pleasure. Thank you for uh, agreeing to appear and helping with the Extra Life Adventure. Uh, it'll be going to a great cause, so it's very much appreciated. Glad uh, to do it. As always, thank you to our viewers, our followers, and subscribers. Thank you, as always, to our moderators as well. Uh, and uh, we'll leave it there. Look for, uh, oh, for Dragon Plus, issue 22 is out now. 
Extra Life uh, donations are ongoing as we speak. We'll be live streaming games on November 3rd. Jeremy Crawford will be appearing not only at TwitchCon at the end of October. He'll be running a game there, but also at GameholeCon in Madison, Wisconsin. So. It's a convention-filled fall. You thought, you thought once the, the products were uh, done that you'd be uh, taking it easy. But no, now we, we have to go to convention season. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone, I will, uh, I will move on and kick it over to Mr. Greg Tito. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Bye, everyone.